we'd like to invite you now to take your Bible and open it to the book of 2 Peter. And we're going to be in the second chapter tonight, looking at what Peter has written. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And in this chapter, Peter is dealing with the problem of false preachers, false prophets, and false teachers. And he's warning the church about these particular folks. He talks about the kind of people they are. He talks about how God views them. He talks about their influence in the church. He talks about God's estimation of them and God's ultimate dealing with them and their ultimate destiny. And it, the whole chapter really is a warning <coughs> to God's people to beware of false prophets, false preachers, and false teachers. And as we get into this uh, chapter, we discover that there's, there's one main truth really that stands out, and that is false preachers and prophets and teachers have always been a problem for God's people and will continue to be a problem until Christ returns. So if, that, if that's the case, and it obviously is because that's what he's revealing to us here, uh, then we need to be able to identify these false um, teachers, false prophets, and, uh, and we need to know how to deal with it. So uh, let's, let's listen carefully because this is a problem. It was a problem in the church in that day long ago. It's a problem in Christ's church today, according to what Peter says here. So now we're not going to read the whole um, chapter up front, but we're going to just look at it as we go through. So you'll need to keep your Bible handy and open to chapter 2 so you can glance down and see what the verse actually says. And there are several things that stand out here, but first of all, notice, if you will, the presence of false prophets and false teachers. He says in verse 1, just the first part of the verse, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Now, he's talking about false prophets, false teachers, false preachers, people who claim to speak for God, but in reality they don't. People who claim to be teaching the word of God, but in reality they're distorting the scripture or making it say something that God never intended for it to say or outrightly uh, denying the scripture. But they're, they're claiming to do this in the name of God. They're claiming to speak for God to communicate spiritual truth on his behalf, and yet the reality is they're not doing that at all. So he says here, they arose among God's people in former times. If you go back uh, in the Old Testament, you'll find that there were false prophets in those days. Uh, we mentioned one in the message this morning, I believe, and that was Balaam. If you're, uh, he was a false prophet. And you come into the New Testament and you find warnings against false prophets that the church had to deal with uh, in the New Testament days. And, and he says here uh, in this same verse, they've continued to arise among God's people and they will continue to arise. So this is an ongoing problem. And uh, that means that it's a problem today in the church. So we just need to be aware of that and, and be aware of what God says about that in this passage. Now, notice the characteristics of false prophets. There are numerous characteristics of false prophets, false teachers, and false preachers that you find in this chapter. Uh, beginning in verse 1 with the second part of verse 1, going all the way down through verse 19, you find just characteristic after characteristic. I want you to know this is not a happy sermon tonight. It's not a pleasant sermon. In fact, uh, it's, it, it wearies you just to think about all that's said here about false prophets and false teachers. Uh, so I want to warn you about that. It's, it's kind of depressing when you, when you actually look at it. There's so much here 
and it's not good. So just be aware of that as you, as you go through this. But it's necessary because we need to know the nature of these folks. We need to know the characteristics of them. And, and Peter doesn't hold back. Uh, for instance, in verse 1, he calls them false. They are false prophets. They are false teachers. They're not true prophets. They're not true teachers. They pretend to speak for God, but they do not. They pretend to communicate uh, God's word, God's message, and they pretend to communicate the truth of Scripture, but they do not speak for God, and they distort or outrightly deny the truth of Scripture oftentimes. Now, there's a second thing he says about them in these verses. They secretly introduce destructive heresies. You see that also in verse 1. That word secret or secretly, they secretly do this. Uh, the word secretly means subtly or stealthily. Uh, it means to do something on the sly. Oftentimes, false prophets, false teachers, false preachers don't just come right out and uh, blast you with their untruth. Uh, oftentimes, they do it on the sly. They just kind of sneak it in. Uh, like, you know, Jesus talked a lot about leaven and being careful about uh, the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, he told his disciples. And leaven, you can take just a little bit of leaven, it'll leaven the whole lump, Jesus said. And, uh, and that's the way it is with false teaching. And oftentimes they'll just sort of sneak it in, a little bit here, a little bit there, and you don't even realize it until uh, it's doing serious damage. So it says here in verse 1, they secretly introduce destructive heresies. The word destructive. Me, and it's a strong word in the Greek language. It means leading to damnation. It means dangerous, deadly, designed to bring destruction and ruin. And he, he uses that word in conjunction with the word heresy, destructive heresies. Heresies refers to false teachings, distortions of scriptural truth, lies, and untruths. So what do they do? They secretly introduce this into their teaching. They're like someone who secretly puts poison into another person's food. The victim consumes the food not realizing that the poison in it is going to kill him. And that's the way these false teachers are. And then again in verse 1, he says, they deny the master. Well, of course, the master here is Jesus. They deny Jesus. Jesus is the one who paid for our salvation with his suffering and death on the cross, and with the shedding of his blood. But these false teachers and prophets often deny that Jesus' shed blood is sufficient for our salvation. Oftentimes they want to add something to that, or that he is the only one who can save us. They oftentimes want to say there are many ways that you can be saved. You hear that a lot today. And that he is the sovereign Lord and that people need to submit their lives to his authority and rule. That's pretty unpopular today too. To really submit to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and obey him, live for him unashamedly. Um, or that there's uh, no other way to be saved except by coming to God through faith in Jesus Christ. They deny that oftentimes. And oftentimes, false prophets also deny such important doctrines, scripturally, as the virgin birth of Christ, the deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the atoning death of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the doctrine of the coming judgment, the doctrine of hell. That's a taboo subject today in our day. Folks don't like to talk about hell or think about that, and they deny the existence of it, saying God would never send anybody to hell. But Jesus talked more about hell than anybody in Scripture did. Uh, infinite love was warning people against going to that awful place. A lot of people are going to be there. Salva they, they deny salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. Uh, they deny the inspiration of Scripture oftentimes. So all of these great and, and vital, Im, vitally important doctrines of our faith, um, oftentimes you'll find these false teachers and false prophets denying first one and then another. And what the bottom line is, 
these false teachers do not accept the authority of God's word nor the authority of Christ over their lives because if they did, they wouldn't do that kind of thing. Another thing, they involve themselves in sensuality and immorality. Look at verse 2. The word sensuality in verse 2 refers to unbridled, unrestrained living, doing whatever titillates and pleases fleshly senses and desires, involving oneself in immoral and lascivious pursuits, living a life of sexual lust and desire. And he says these false teachers oftentimes involve themselves in living a life of sensuality and lust and even immorality. They may look religious and they may appear to be holy on the outside, but inside they are driven by sensuality and the lust of the flesh oftentimes. He says something else. They are motivated by selfishness and greed. Look again at verse 3, the first part of the verse. The word greed there means an inordinate desire for things or for money, wanting what other people have. It, it refers to covetousness. And one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not covet, but these folks covet. They often have an ulterior, ulterior motive in their teaching, in their preaching, and in the ministries that they head and that is to get what you have. Oftentimes, that's all that false teachers and false prophets are about, getting what you have. They exploit people with false words and lies, verse 3 says. The word exploit means to take advantage of. They take advantage of people uh, through the use of their false words, their, their lies, their untruths, their, their cunning and false arguments that they use. They sound good but they are liars and deceivers. They indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires. According to verse 10, the first part of that verse, the word indulge means to give into or to gorge oneself on, to feed on, to be a slave to something. And these folks indulge the flesh. They're slaves to their flesh, the old corrupt sinful nature. They are slaves to the corrupt sensuous sinful desires of the flesh they walk after the flesh and indulge in the lust of polluting passions. They despise authority, according to verse 10. Uh, the word despise just means to hate or to scorn. They hate authority. They scorn authority. Authority here refers to uh, any authority over them, whether it be the authority of Christ or of man or even of governing authorities. These people that Peter's talking about don't like authority. They don't like to be under authority. Uh, they resist that and they rebel against it. They don't like to be accountable to anybody. They hate being accountable and they rebel against God-ordained authorities. Verse 10 also says that they're daring. The word daring here means to be presumptuous or audacious or brazen or rebellious or defiant. It's talking about somebody who's always pushing the limits. Uh, so they're daring, and he also says in that verse, they're self-willed. Self-willed means being bent on doing one's own will rather than God's will, being obstinate, determined to go one's own way, ruled by self, selfish desires. So Peter says they're daring and they're self-willed. He says in verse 10 and verse 11, that they do not show proper regard for or respect for spiritual powers and authorities, especially as this relates to angels. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to get at what he means there. Uh, I think you can dig out what he's saying, but, but let me try to give you a translation of that verse um, that might help us to kind of understand that a little bit more. He, he says, they do not tremble, they're not afraid, they do not tremble in fear when they revile or defame or blaspheme or scoff at angelic majesties. Literally, the word angelic ma majesties literally means glorious ones. And it's a reference to angels. 
uh, whereas he says angels who are greater in might and power than these false prophets and teachers are do not bring a reviling judgment or a defaming charge or a railing accusation or a blasphemous charge or defamation against them, against these false prophets and teachers before the Lord. Instead, the angels leave all judgment to God. Now, it's a little, it's a little hard to, to get at what he's talking about there. Apparently, this was a problem that Peter identified in the early church. But I can tell you what I think about when I read those words. Uh, I think about the kind of thing you sometimes hear on some of the religious uh, broadcasts, either on television or on the radio, where you find some preacher or uh, some teacher talking about how he orders Satan around or orders demons to do this or that or the other, how he exercises that kind of authority over Satan and demons, and he's telling us to do the same kind of thing. Now, you know, whenever I hear that, I have to go back and think about what does the Bible really say about that? Uh, and, and you find instances in Scripture where there were those who did give commands to Satan and to demons. Jesus did. Uh, Jesus cast demons out of people. And Jesus told Satan to get lost one time. He, he said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, and um, Jesus had the authority and the power to do that. There were those instances in Scripture where he delegated that authority and power to the twelve, and they would go out and they cast out demons, the Scripture says. And you come into the book of Acts and you find some instances there where some of the apostles also cast out demons and some references to where others in other uh, areas did as well. But when you put the totality of Scripture down beside the number of times that you find that and the Bible teaching that the Christian, the ordinary everyday Christians go around casting out demons and, and ordering Satan around, you really don't find that that much in the Scripture. Now, can it happen? Yes. Can a Christian cast out a demon? Yes, I think under certain circumstances. I think that's very possible. But uh, I'm just saying that doesn't seem to be the ordinary thing that we are to go about doing in Scripture because there's just not an emphasis on that in the, the teaching and doctrine taken as a whole um, very often in the New Testament. And I think that says something about that. Uh, I think what Peter is talking about here is we need to demonstrate proper respect for angelic authorities and angelic um, majesties, as he called them. And obviously he's saying that these false teachers did not do that, and they were trying to get others not to do that as well. Now, there's another passage that may shed a little light on this if you'll just turn over a few pages to the right until you come to the book of Jude in Jude 1, 8 through 10. Jude writes this. He says, Yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority. He's talking about the same folks. They reject authority. And then he says, and they revile angelic majesties in verse 8. But then he gives a contrasting view here in, in verses 9 and 10. He says, but Michael, the archangel. Michael is the archangel, the, one, the angel over all the other angels. Michael is very powerful, a high-ranking angel, one of the good angels, one of the holy angels. Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against Satan a railing judgment or accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, now what Jude is saying is, apparently there was some sort of argument between Michael and Satan when, when, um, when Moses died. And Satan wanted to claim Moses' body, probably to make a shrine out of it so the people would worship that. 
And Michael wouldn't let him do that. But in the course of their argument, he says here that Michael did not pronounce a railing accusation against Satan. But what Michael said was, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Michael wouldn't even do that. Michael is the most powerful angel there is. He wouldn't do that uh, to the devil. And, and so uh, he said, the Lord rebuke you. And, and then he goes on in verse 10 and says, but these men, these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. He says Michael wouldn't even do that, but these men dare to do that kind of thing. I'm not saying a person can't cast out a demon. I know brothers who have done that, and uh, I, I have no doubt that they did that, and, and we see it in Scripture. But I'm just saying um, there's a certain respect that we ought to have for spiritual authorities and, um, and, and, and that means whether they are good or evil. We need to respect their power, and we need to respect their office, and, and um, uh, we just need to have a healthy respect. I can kill a rattlesnake, and you can too, but, but I'm going to respect that beast. I'm not going to let him, I'm, I'm going to have a healthy fear of him. I'm not going to let him bite me if I can help it. Uh, Somebody that's not sane would probably pick up one and, you know, fondle it. Uh, but, but, you know, that's crazy. You shouldn't do that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we need to have a healthy respect for the angelic realm. A and apparently these false teachers were not doing that, and that's why Peter addresses that here. Now let's go on to verse 12. They revile where they have no knowledge. That's related to what he just said. Verse 12, the word revile means to blaspheme or speak disparagingly of holy things or of God or the things of God or of God himself. They revile where they have no knowledge, uh, where they are totally ignorant and without understanding or appreciation. They just spout off things about that. I love what John MacArthur says at that point. He says, these false teachers have no sensitivity to the power and presence of demons or holy angels, but like wild animals insubordinate, insolent, and arrogant, they charge into the spiritual realm, cursing away at persons and matters that they don't even understand. And that seems to be what Peter's saying here. They revile, they use this big sounding language and all these commands, and they don't even know what they're talking about or what they're up against. Um, they do wrong, verse 13 says. They act in ways that are contrary to the word of God, their attitudes, words, and deeds are marked by unrighteousness. They, re, they uh, revel in the daytime, verse 13 says. That is, they're not ashamed of their sins, nor do they try to cover them up. Instead, they flaunt them. They parade their sin. They are so bold and brash about their sins that they don't even wait for the cover of darkness in order to commit them. They just go around in the daytime doing all kinds of stuff that's wrong. They revel in their deceptions, verse 13 says. They rejoice in and celebrate their effectiveness in deceiving people. They carouse with others even while attending church functions, verse 13 implies. They sit with Christians at church gatherings and fellowships, giving the appearance of spirituality, but inwardly they're motivated by arrogance and immoral desire. 